This recording is in progress. Namaste, namaste, precious, precious souls. How's everybody? Happy Monday. Welcome to Book of Life. Ready to have some fun. It's going to be a good one. I like this one. I like it. The next two are going to be really good. I think it's um, I think it's important, especially with the things that we kind of grew up with, you know, from the orthodox point of view about what life is about and what death is about. And I think that um, we just thank God for the spiritual teachers and for the historian hierarchy and these great teachers that share with us the truths with a capital T. So without any more of my dialogue, let us invoke, and then we will have some fun. Go ahead and just relax. Place the tip of the tongue on the palate. Make sure your legs are uncrossed, your hands or palms or palms facing up. Be nice and relaxed. To the great architect of the universe, the heavenly father, heavenly mother. To Holy Master Choa, to Buddha Padmasambhava, to the circle of seven, to Robert and Erlin Cheney, to Master Asaleya, Lord Kutumi, Lord Rama, Lord Zoser, to the Astarian hierarchy, to the Lord Rabbi Yehoshua Bar Miriam, the Lord Christ, to the Holy Mother Mary, Lord Kuan Yin Buddha, Lord Gautama Buddha, to all the great ones, our celestial guides, our angel guides, our higher souls, our over souls, to the planetary logos, Sana Kumara, the ancient of days, the solar logos, Lord Amen Ra, the universal logos, the central spiritual sun. We humbly invoke fear divine blessings. May we be a channel through which thy holy ones approach the world. May we be a center for the radiation of thy power. Teach us to travel light that we may better gain the heights Break the bonds that bind. Teach us to give ourselves entirely to thy service, to attune ourselves to thy will. Teach us to lay down the small personal life for the greater cosmic life and to love with the love of God in full faith. Tat tat so. We fully release all unauthorized connections, front and back. Cut, 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 cut. Right. So today, we're going to be on the journey of every human being. It is third degree, lesson 10. The fourth dimension, death, whether it is the death we realize on the earth plane or any of the other deaths we encounter as we ascend on to higher planes, is simply a change in the timing of our form. Physical forms vibrate at certain rates of vibration, amendable to that of Earth. As long as you inhabit a form vibrating at that rate of speed, you will be able to see Earth, men, women, and all material objects. But alter the timing of your physical form, and they will not only vanish before you, but you likewise will vanish to them. Death, therefore, is an alteration of speed or vibration. Actually, the physical form could be so altered that beings of Earth would never taste death as we speak of it. We would simply have transmuted our forms to a higher timing. When Jesus disappeared in the midst of his tormentors, he was manipulating the law of vibration to change the molecular substance of his physical form. One day, we too will learn how to accomplish this feat. Discarding the physical form at present, however, so that the consciousness may accommodate itself to a form with altered frequency, usually requires a pause in consciousness. For the soul is discarding a body vibrating at a slow wavelength and is to become conscious of inhabiting a form of higher substance, so that the transfer from one vibration to another can be gentle. There usually is an intermediate state of consciousness. It is the self's built-in anesthesia for the soul's transition, not to deaden any pain, rather to cushion any shock entailed in entering a world of increased vibrational frequency. Soul preparation for death. Thoughts associated with death are, to most minds, dark, foreboding, fear-filled, and dreaded. 
To a few, it represents a release from pain and affliction, even though they believe it to be a state of non-existence. To many, it means a long sleep awaiting the end of the world, resurrection, and judgment day. Again, to a few, death is simply a word symbolizing a process of transition, a birth from the earth plane and the womb of the physical form into a new and better world with a new and better form. To a degree, it is terrifying to all, for when viewed from our normal level of perception, it seems to be the unknown. Since death is but a natural process, it has an automatic beginning. As soon as a human form attains its physical maturity, when the spirit finally assumes full control, that form begins the natural process of death. The body does not die suddenly, it only seems to. Although the change is imperceptible, the transition proceeds over many years. The form gradually relinquishes its powers and faculties as the soul within gradually assumes them. Beginning at adulthood, the soul is no longer traveling an involving descending arc as it did in the early part of the incarnation. It has turned toward evolving. It has entered the arc of spiritual ascendancy, its tendencies upreach toward the worlds of spirit. The normal process of death begins in the physical form around the age of 21 when the form has gained its physical maturity and fulfilled its etheric pattern. The mind continues to unfold, to grow, to mature, enabling the personality to become older but wiser. As maturity advances to old age, the physical form succumbs to subtle natural changes, just as the soul prepares itself for another incarnation on earth prior to its birth in the physical form, so does the soul require a preparation for death and withdrawal from that form. Birth is far more than issuing a physical form out of the mother's womb and into physical manifestation. True, the first breath begins the inflow of the individualized life stream at that time, but the soul does not complete its union with the personality before the seventh year and is frequently still in the process until the 21st year. The preparation for withdrawal of the soul also takes place gradually. The aging body only indicates that specific changes are occurring in the corporal organism, the, be the better to prepare the soul for its coming sojourn into a higher life. The hidden blessings of seniority. Old age is a great deal more than the slowing down processes of the physical form. These are only outer indications of an inner process. When this inner graduation begins, the physical organs react accordingly. The soul, continually developing and expanding its faculties, begins to extend them as intuitive feelers toward the higher spheres. It is the gradual strengthening of the soul which causes the apparent deterioration of the physical form, for the soul is taking unto itself the vitality it once shared with the body. As the soul begins to absorb more and more of the vital energies necessary for its unfoldment and withdrawal, the body reacts to its decreasing supply of life force. Atom after atom slips away in an imperceptible emanation from the physical body, like slow falling sand in an hourglass. Instead of being replaced in the physical, these departing atoms are transmuted to take their place in the soul body. It should not be thought that this spiritual body is something apart, awaiting somewhere aloft our time of demise. It is a body of atomic essence, even now permeating the physical form. The two are coexistent. Every experience of the mortal influences and molds the spiritual form within. While the physical requires food and drink and warmth and shelter, the spiritual form finds its sustenance in nurturing thought force. If the desires are of the more harmful or negative sort, the atoms will form a shell of astral darkness over the soul. If the thoughts are beautiful, the astral form will shine with a starry radiance. Its, feud, its food is purity, goodness, truth, and wisdom. Therefore, though one be wealthy materially, one may be poor in spirit. If one would nurture the spiritual to perfection, one must seek education and instruction in spiritual things. With the gradual transmutation of the physical atoms, the body slowly becomes incapable of performing the office required by the spirit. Often old age turns into senility. The faculties of intellect, which were once alert, become weak, clouded by both physical and mental decline. 
the brilliant alacrity once in evidence departs. It is usually true that the older one grows physically, the one more one grows in spiritual perfection. As the flames of earthly passion abate, the dying embers kindle the fires of a new love, that of the spirit. The debris of a lifetime drops away. Old hates mellow, old ambitions fade. Many live among the memories of bygone years in their normal waking consciousness, while their spiritual consciousness unfolds like a rosebud opening into full bloom. The deterioration of the physical form only indicates the vitalizing of the inner spiritual form. Even though one may be outwardly unaware of one's inner spiritual expansion, and even though the physical self only exhibits senility and loss of mental acumen, still the inner awareness is tending heavenward. The universe does not itself become more universal, nor does infinity become more infinite but the intuitive faculties often perceive a gradual expansion of psychic awareness. Those who die in the prime of life, possessing the firmness of beauty and beauty of youth, sometimes require longer to build an equal beauty in the spiritual form. But to grow old in physical age is usually to grow into spiritual youth. Physical challenges are not reflected in the spiritual form. If there are challenges, they are of the soul. Many a plain exterior covers a spiritual form of exquisite beauty. Good thoughts, good deeds, and a search for wisdom confer blessings and grace upon the spiritual features. However feeble and physical, however old and wrinkled, the truly good are always spiritually beautiful. To witness the birth into spirit land of these souls grown beautiful is to witness unexcelled rapture. Once the consciousness has passed beyond the claim of the cerebral atoms of the physical brain and the spiritual form floats poised above the aged frame, how sweet it is to witness the unfolding spiritual consciousness inhaling the atmosphere of the spiritual world, to see awareness steal back over the features, that first bewildered look of astonishment that everything seems so real, so substantial, so natural, Frequently, it is difficult for the liberated soul to understand that there has been a transition, the rapture of the second birth. Many think they are experiencing a vivid dream. They realize they are very much alive, that their bodies are perfect in structure and function. They hear with their ears and see with their eyes and speak with their lips. They behold friends who had previously crossed the Crystal River. Yet it sometimes requires a fleeting period of time to become fully convinced that it is not all a heavenly dream. Once conviction becomes certain, the joy of reunion is beyond human description. Before I formed thee in the womb, I knew thee, the cosmic clock of destiny. Before your last physical birth, while you still resided in the realms of the unseen, you yourself decided that it was time to make another journey to earth. I write now of Astarians and spiritually advanced souls. And at the time, you knew the highlights of your mission. You also knew how long you would remain. The timing of your coming and your future departure were set on a great cosmic clock. Not a clock as we know it, but a built-in timer in your own cosmic nervous system. A timer set to affinity vibrations. For whom the bell tolls. At birth, the soul merged with the body through an electromagnetic hold and that attraction was set for release by a certain cosmic affinity. When the time arrives for the body to release its electromagnetic hold upon the soul, the two will separate. We call such a separation death. The time of the release is the moment you will die, not one second sooner nor one second later. Neither disease, war, nor accident can change the timing of the vibrational lock. There have been known to be extensions of one's time, for some exceptional spiritual purpose, but these are rare exceptions of the law. Suicides disrupt the natural process of this law, reaping thereby their own karmic consequences. The shedding of the physical form is as natural as a chick emerging from its shell. And actually, once a soul has entered the process of withdrawal, it becomes acutely aware that the action is a familiar one. Having been accomplished in every in part every night during sleep. While asleep, the silver cord remains intact. The silver cord is the electromagnetic cord which holds the soul bound to the body. 
see lesson 21, second degree. During the death process, this stream of energy is disconnected and the pitcher, body, is broken at the fountain. It can no longer contain the pranic life principle. The actual event of death indicates that the withdrawal preparation of the soul from the physical body has been completed. When the spiritual hourglass has run its course, when every time Adam has escaped the confines of the body, the soul's time has come. The karmic time of this incarnation has run out. The cosmic key turns the lock in your clock of destiny, releasing the death hormones which signal your departure, and the soul turns again homeward toward the spheres from whence it came at the time of your physical birth. Humanity's Three Pathways Humanity divides itself into three categories. One, the earth-focused person lives life, earth life, principally through the senses. This is the one whose soul is in early development. They focus on the physical world immediately around them. The, the soul person divides interests between gratification of the senses and satisfying the mental conquests. This is our average person. Three, the spirit person recognizes the illusion of the sense world and seeks to employ spiritual perception to its fullest. This is our initiate, the young soul. Let's write of you as being a young soul. After death, you, the young soul, having opened a few windows to a higher world, will view your place on the astral through considerably limited vision and perception. Because you have only known earthly sensations, your thoughts turn constantly earthward, and you are drawn through vibrational attraction to that which gave you sensual pleasure on earth. Thus, your doors of perception are clouded, and you see through a glass darkly. You enter a world very much patterned after your earth world. Since your channels of higher perception usually remain closed, you often live out your time between incarnations unaware of the real spiritual world and its sublime attributes lying all about you. Just as earth beings live out their earth lives unaware of the other world interpenetrating their own. When does the bardo start? Often the young soul is unaware of the inhabitants of the upper realms. You are dwelling on a plane and in substance unfamiliar to you. Occasionally, such a soul will reincarnate within a few days after death. You will be caught in the maelstrom of the after-death transitional state called the bardo, about which we shall have much to say in future lessons. More often, you will spend time in what is sometimes known as purgatory, eventually ascending through the higher planes only briefly, since all souls, including, including long one, young ones, seldom live out a lifetime without doing some measure of good, you may eventually attain some awareness of the causal plane, the heaven world, just prior to your descent into another physical birth. Awakening on the causal is different for every individual. Many earthbound souls will choose to be drawn back to earth long before reaching the causal state of consciousness. For those who do attain it, the awakening or return to consciousness on that plane will be brief. The awareness will open only to a vague subliminal glimpse of the supreme glory of the soul's true home. Such a causal experience will seem more like a sleep and a forgetting, for the young soul will not have developed sufficient mind power to wake into full potential on the causal level. You will have created only a shallow storehouse of memories, our self-formed magnetic webs of rebirth. At this stage, the soul seems to have a choice of going forward or backward, but the young soul's karmic web will draw you back to the plane of your greatest need, the earth life, the plane of matter. Your own soul will create the choice of another physical existence. Your thoughts during your past earth life will have woven webs of force which automatically draw you again to the sense, to the scene of your passion, your errors in judgment, Lack of interest in spiritual matters and your physical attachments will mean that you will realize very little of the light of the causal plane before the cosmic clock calls you again earthward for another opportunity cycle. The average person. The after-death state of average person or the soul person is altogether different. Again, for clarity, let's speak of average person as you. For you, death is a natural continuance. Life on the inner planes will follow much the same pattern as the soul's earthly endeavors. 
That is, your inner problems will still exist, your ambitions, your loves, your dreams, your hopes, your talents. There will be much remaining for you to overcome, but you will pause in the illusion land of the astral only long enough to rest your consciousness from turmoil just ended on earth. When your windows of perception begin to open and your mental muscles feel the need of greater challenge, you will travel upward out of the illusion land of the astral. As average person, you live your life on earth suspended between two mysteries, the mystery of birth and the mystery of death. But unlike the young soul, you find time to consider particularly the afterlife. It is the development of your own mind power, however, focused upon ambitions of earth and faced with the fierce run of competition, which prevents you from ever giving full consideration to the ultimate purpose of your earth life. There is no little time for leisure or the pursuit of philosophy. Your life is filled with the usual run of events. It contains a measure of joy, a measure of sorrow, and a full portion of petty, irritating problems that seem bent on preventing what might have been a search for truth. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You form some idea of the after-death state according to the training given by your parents, your own breadth of reading experience, and associations you establish through the passing years. Eventually, according to which religion or philosophy sways you, you will determine that there is immortality and an afterlife, or you will believe that you go down to the grave to enter the long sleep and await millenniums for the second coming, the end of the world and judgment day, or you will believe that you become non-existent. You either realize the absurdity of eternal damnation or you face death fear filled with the possibility of such an indictment for yourself. This is the average person. This is the soul person, the soul who has lighted a few windows of perception through which your vision might project, who has departed somewhat from the world of senses. You have applied some sharpening process to your intuition, but not enough to pierce the clouds of unknowing. Your immediate after death state is a continuation of much that you are. You are still the ordinary individual, except that some of the blinders which limited your vision and understanding on earth are removed. Even so, you are not transformed in the twinkling of an eye. The transition is only in your form. Like the young soul, you must not be ushered too suddenly into too high an estate. You have not yet developed the spiritual strength to bear it. You are a part of the vast multitude, the earthly host, that passes perpetually into the unseen world, longing to know but frightened of the potential. You will remain in the limited consciousness state of the astral so that you might rest in a world very much like your earth life, only until your awakening spiritual perception feels the need of wider horizons. Then your own soul development will take you higher. Your advancement will be gradual as your spiritual awareness increases. Look now to eternal qualities. In your wider, larger world, you discover that your mind is the focal point of your being. Having discarded your form of flesh and blood, your mind is no longer harnessed by the brain cells and the intricate web of nerves constituting the cerebral spinal system through which you communicated on Earth. Your consciousness, expanding with your glorious new freedom, learns the flexibility of your new form and how to cause it to conform to higher dimensions. Because you did develop soul qualities, your tenure in the unseen realms will be mostly in the realms of the soul, removed from the lower planes of the young soul. In this land, again, the soul perceives only through the windows it has opened during its earthly sojourn. You will see beauty all about you. For your beauty is all that exists there. But you will see only limited versions of it. Since your experience, you sense your own perceptions are limited, Blind persons of earth see not earth's beauty, not because the beauty is lacking, but because they do not possess the faculty to perceive it. So is it on the soul levels of the high astral. You will perceive beauty to the degree that your mental blinders have been removed. But let us consider the soul person who has opened wider doors of perception. You recognize yourself to be in a new world, entering the lower mental plane, you become aware that your form is somewhat changed. The soul's metempsychosis. 
you might be compared to the butterfly who retains some portion of its caterpillar form. There are many similarities between the soul person's old and new forms, yet surrounding the new are billowing colors, lights, and shapes. Just as the form of the butterfly takes on different shapes and hues and colors, so does your new mental form. It will assume symmetry and color according to the influence of the soul's karmic past. Thus it may transcend Earth's most indescribable beauty, or it may assume bizarre or grotesque patterns according to the thoughts that have dominated your deeper consciousness. You will discover that you no longer see simply through the eyes, but with the entire form, that you no longer hear only with the ears, but must adjust your consciousness to accommodate thought waves that strike your entire form. You quickly discover that on this plane, the mind and its power far transcends that of form. Here, if you would accomplish great things, you must control great mental power. You must learn not only how to project it, but how to manipulate it for your own creative happiness. You must learn how to accommodate your life according to the flow of thought waves. For of these is your new world constructed, realizing the substance of thoughts. In appearances, this world somewhat resembles that of Earth, except that its solids seem fluidic enough to respond to mind power. You quickly become aware of the law of vibration, for upon it will hinge your well-being. On this lower mental plane, the intense emotions are given life force. That is, if you love someone deeply on Earth, that love will be immeasurably enhanced on the mental plane. But the same is true of hate. If you had an old enemy on Earth, when you both arrive in the other world, the emotion of hate will inevitably draw you together and there, Unless you have learned to transcend such a negative emotion, you may engage in a mental battle, much as you would a fist battle on earth. Thus, in this world, the soul person again knows pain, but not the pain experienced in your physical form. Your pain is that which can only be experienced in the mind. Sorrow, not connected with grief of earth. A spiritual sorrow. This is why the teachers invariably instruct disciples to work through and express in some healthy way all their emotions. Learn to express your anger, your sadness, your hurt in ways that will move you forward and that have the best potential for moving the relationship forward in positive ways. Do not deny your feelings, but make every effort to learn healthy ways to identify and express them. For emotions unexpressed or poorly expressed can lead to stunted emotional growth, physical disease, mental and emotional unbalance, negative relationships, and living a life of bottled up anger, resentment, and low self-esteem and hatred towards yourself and others. Never, never, never hate. If you cannot love, try to develop true neutral detachment after sending the person light for hatred will establish an electromagnetic attraction between yourself and the hatred one that must be overcome later on the mental level, a karmic tie. This is why forgiveness becomes so important on earth. Hating an enemy for what he or she has done to you places you on a vibrational level with the other person's hatred, and the conflict can bring suffering on the mental plane when you meet. For meet you will eventually, inevitably. If you can forgive while yet on earth, you will have learned a supreme spiritual lesson and then severed all ties if that is what you choose. If your enemy continues to hit you and you do not respond with a like emotion, that hatred can do you no harm. It will only turn again upon the sender. It becomes the other person's problem, not yours, which brings to memory a meaningful story humorous but extremely apropos. An elevator operator observed that two particular gentlemen boarded his elevator each morning simultaneously. The same one invariably spat upon the other, whereupon the injured one always withdrew his handkerchief and patiently wiped his face. He never became angry, never seemed insulted, never engaged in retaliation. Finally, the be bewildered operator, unable to withhold his curiosity, inquired of him why he so silently endured such indignation. It's not my problem, answered the wise man. I have only to wipe away physical symbol of his hate. He has to live with it. And so it is. The one actively engaged in hate is the one with the problem. 
The one who refuses to be drawn into the quagmire of retaliation and revenge really has no problem. She or he has risen above the level of hate through have hate thought currents and is not subject to their destructive energies. If you in turn are the antagonist, if you are caught in the web of hate or revenge or have committed some wrong against a fellow being, seek that person out and ask forgiveness. If possible, make amends in every self-respecting way you can while still in the physical form, else you must face him or her someday on the inner worlds and make right the wrong. What goes around comes around. Retributive justice, inevitable. You cannot escape such an encounter, for you owe a debt of retribution and it must be paid. It is far easier to level such karma here on earth. Sooner or later, you will discover that you can attain no greater heights over there until you have sincerely asked for his or her forgiveness and have performed any reasonable task consistent with the level of offense to obtain that forgiveness. If, following your sincere asking and the accomplishment of such a task, if one is appropriate, the other person still refuses to forgive, the problem then lies with that person and not with you. That person will be held, will then be held accountable for hardness of heart and lack of forgiveness. You have no control over whether or not that person will forgive you, and your spiritual growth will not be held up if sincere forgiveness was sought but was simply not forthcoming. Therefore, ask forgiveness now, the sooner the better. Try to leave the earth plane with your slate clean, with no penalties of unforgiveness marked against you, and sincerely forgiving all those who have come to you with a similar request. Pain, pain and pleasure. The point at hand here is, does one suffer pain and pleasure, happiness and despair on the mental plane, not of the form, but of the mind? Here, however, you quickly become aware that if you do not think right, you create your own mental suffering. Despair brings its own rewards, and love the most inconceivable bliss. The soul on this plane can experience love far beyond the ecstasies of earth, and we shall present special teachings concerning this in future lessons. It requires not much time for the soul person on the mental level to spread your wings, or, in other words, expand your auric forces. You learn that if you would be happy here, you must radiate happiness to others. If you do not wish conflict in your own life, you hasten to cease causing it in the lives of others. And here one begins to understand the true transcendency of love and the qualities and results of this superb emotion. Once one has attained this understanding, life becomes beautiful beyond words to express. What goes into the bank comes out. Because you did not complete the perfection of your true spiritual form, the causal body, the law of karma will eventually attract you into a new physical embodiment responding to the magnetic pull of unfulfilled desire atoms. The average person will eventually experience an intense longing to return to earth for another physical existence. The peace and contentment of the higher world grows tedious. You recognize no progress, no challenge. You see about you surroundings that resemble those you knew on earth. Yet there is no cause for struggle, never a conquest to be met. Since by now you will have outlived your purgatory, and are purged of personal impurities. But even with such seeming freedom from necessities, the soul becomes aware of extreme limitations. Such freedom from necessities does not bring freedom from desires, and with the opening doors of awareness, you yearn for some kind of struggle, the contest of challenge, some ecstasy of reward to be experienced. Freed from the heavy bonds of flesh, you have increased mental power through which will come the awareness that while incarnated, you did not take full advantage of opportunities offered. You will innately realize that you cannot ascend higher until you have mastered the inner conflicts created while incarnated. Knowing you will be striving under insurmountable handicaps if you attempt to progress into higher octaves of consciousness until you have better fitted yourself for such heights, you will voluntarily turn again earthward for another incarnation. You subconsciously realize that you must descend in order to ascend, that your re-entry into the world of matter is necessary for further progress. You know another incarnation will only the opportunity will offer the opportunity not only of overcoming your remaining unevolved tendencies, but of gaining increased spiritual stature, 
Another life on earth fills your greatest need at this particular time in your spiritual evolution. Sometimes, too, you choose to incarnate without touching the sublime heights of the causal. The soul who does ascend into the land of the flame awakens to an awareness limited again by its spiritual perception. Here you will unite in part with your own overshadowing divine spirit. You spend your brief time on the causal plane in agonies of contemplation. You will be able to enjoy only your own allotted reward of joy, ecstasy, intense delights. But to the extent that your soul is capable of absorption, you will know yourself as you really are. It is not possible for the earth mind to conceive such experiences as occur on the causal plane, for it is not your normal level of consciousness. The soul tastes of heaven to the exact proportion that it gave it to others during its sojourn on earth. When you have reaped your harvest of just rewards, you will turn towards the, the world of matter again to assume a coat of skin, the best of all God's planes to offer the soul a challenge for rapid progressions. One well-lived incarnation in matter can attain a thousand years of heaven for the soul and perchance even true liberation. Initiate. Many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called into rebirth, but few are chosen by the unseen hierarchy for discipleship, adeptship, and initiation. The initiate differs from the masses. You are an Astarian initiate. Like other true spiritual seekers, in your memory field, you retain an awareness of the spiritual world you have left, and you will seem a stranger here. Innately, you realize that your true home lies up yonder, that you have come down here to fulfill some special mission, and you will retain either directly or indirectly, consciously or unconsciously, an open channel of inspiration to the higher realms of light. Such a soul has come to serve the cause of Earth's entire evolution. Your life is a living effort to make the world a more heavenly place. You know no fear of death, for you recognize it for what it truly is. You look to it as life's greatest adventure, and when you pass through death's portals, your beautiful soul will bypass the illusion land of the astral and the lower world of the mind. If you choose, you may proceed straight to the causal plane, the true home of the soul. For the disciple, the adept, and the initiate, death becomes an open doorway to regions of glory. You too may remain near earth, not from necessity, but because of a great unselfish love or an unfulfilled longing to complete a mission of spiritual service. But even so, the hours and days of your inner plane life will be filled with joy, and you will experience every kind of opportunity for service, which, because of mundane responsibilities, you were unable to perform on earth. On the causal, you will be no stranger. You will have come home. On this level, the soul gradually refines its form. That is, you learn how to live both within and without your form. You learn how to use your mind constructively, molding the tenuous mental substance to the betterment of your life, how to control the mental substance and give it life force. The song of the soul, this is my country. Eventually, for the initiate, there may come a time when your soul too yearns for a transition, a change. You have arrived at the time when your soul has absorbed all the mind attributes developed during your last day on earth. You have spent your mental energies. Unless you attained a full measure of spiritual mastership during your last incarnation, such an unfulfilled mission may draw you again earthward. But the initiate is given a choice. You can decide whether to take on another earthly existence, bringing wisdom to the world as a philosopher, teacher, or mystic, or you can choose a spiritual mission to be performed over there. You may become, for instance, a guardian angel or guide to someone now about to be born on earth. Clearly, many initiates choose to return to earth, the better to more rapidly realize the divinity of self. A few, having opened wider doors to spiritual perception, are allowed to complete their initiation over there, and they take their places as causal beings in the true world of causes. The Initiate's Tomorrowland. In the Initiate's Other World, you learn how to use your mind constructively, molding the tenuous mental substance to the betterment of your life, how to control the mental substance and give it life force. 
Such a soul has broken the pattern of incarnation. No longer need the soul be sent out from the mother, father's house. You are fulfilled. You are self-realized. If you descend again to earth, you will come of your own free will to accomplish some spiritual mission that will uplift the whole or some portion of humanity. You may descend as a teacher of light, the founder of a new religion, or an immortal philosopher. If you choose to remain on the causal level, your time will be spent in raising up others, for you will not be allowed to progress higher until a certain portion of the human life wave of which you are a part is raised to your level. Greater freedom, greater responsibility. You might become a member of a spiritual group, unit. Such a group consists of several souls, each existing on various planes of consciousness, until every soul on this particular spiritual tree has been lifted to its causal level. It cannot, it will not ascend into higher realms of light. These kindred souls of yours will be evolving through various levels of consciousness, Having attained the causal heights, you may be the ruling spirit on the tree of these linked together souls. And it will be your mission as head of this particular hierarchy to become the parental soul of all the others. You will, in turn, be fed spiritually by a parental monadic force from the monadic plane. Since you inhabit the causal plane, you will become the guardian angel, the parental angel of all the souls threaded together into this group soul of which you have become a part. Some of the souls beneath you in your care may be dwelling on the astral plane in an after-death experience. Some may be incarnated on earth. Some may be on the lower mental planes. Some may be in purgatory. These souls will be under your direct spiritual charge. Like a captain of a small army, you will issue your instructions to those directly beneath you. They, in turn, will carry out the instructions down to the very lowest private. As each soul under you, your charge, gains in spiritual maturity, you are yourself enhanced with ever-broadening horizons of divine wisdom. In such a way do you vicariously master the realms of matter, and not until you have mass so mastered them can you become a citizen of the next higher plane. Only after you have lifted up your appointed soul children and brought them to the causal level of consciousness are you free to ascend higher through the realms of light. We shall have more to teach concerning the kin souls in later lessons. Your upward journey will have endowed you with incalculable wisdom, harvested through inconceivable eons of time. You will have attained knowledge of all good and evil. You will have become a lord of life, having conquered the lower worlds. You are now capable of living without form, except as it exists as pure white light. You are prepared now to unite with your overshadowing spirit, which dwells on the monadic plane. Such a union will be, in no sense, annihilate your individuality. It is simply that you will become another note in the divine harmony of the spheres. You are going to die. Astarian, develop a conscious awareness that you are going to die. This is not said to alarm you. The point is stressed only to make you more aware of an inescapable future event. Of course, you know that you are going to die, yet perhaps you have not saturated your consciousness with the actual reality of it. It is not that you should become morbid nor brooding. It is only that you should mentally prepare for it. You no doubt have thought of the event from a material standpoint. You have made your will or your living trust. You have given full consideration to all those you love. You And you have worked out what you feel is a fair sharing of your possessions and properties. You may have made worthwhile charitable bequests or trusts to deserving institutions. But have you prepared your own self? What have you willed to yourself? What will be your spiritual legacy? Have you done anything to ensure your own spiritual, future spiritual peace of mind and preparedness for living over there? It is that you must learn to become detached while still on earth. Regardless what you own, these possessions are not truly yours. They belong to the world of matter. The moment you depart this life, your possessions cease to be yours and become someone else's. And regardless how carefully you have prepared your wishes, those things which have been your treasures may somehow be mismanaged when you depart. But what difference does it really make? 
Learn to think in terms of eternity. What will it matter a hundred years from now? Learn to possess without being possessed. Keep your eye upon the rainbow and not upon the goal. Learn to let go of your possessions. Enjoy them to the hilt. Acquire as much as you wish, if that makes you happy. But never allow yourself to become attached to things of earth. For the things of earth are earthly, and the true you is spirit. Such attachments will distract you from your true spiritual goals. Therefore, let go. Realize, too, that you are actually more at home in the higher octaves of vibration than you ever were in the body. It is on the earth plane that you are really, really are a stranger. Through the eons, you have spent far more time on the inner planes than in the outer earth life. Many accept eternal life academically and intellectually, but have not truly grasped the full significance of its utter reality. When you do, when you consider that you enter and leave numerous organic bodies in the full sweep of your eternal journey, death assumes its rightful place. The dread terror subsides. Old age fails to frighten you, and you even experience illness, illnesses with less apprehension. Practically practicing peace. You learn to live every day to its very fullest and best. You cease to fret and despair over lost opportunities, for you sense that they will come to you again. You count each incident a lesson learned. You set your spiritual sights upon a star, and you absorb a full portion of its light. But you do not hold it. You open your portals to let it flow through to others. You learn to hold in the center of your consciousness the perpetual thought that you are immortal. You live with it, sleep with it, eat with it, never letting it fully escape your, from your awareness. You draw closer to that infinite being we call God, the Father, Mother. The fear orthodoxy would instill in you slips away. You no more think of fearing God than you think of fearing your most beloved spiritual teacher. You feel an inner poise pervading your entire being, an indescribable basic peace of mind that underrides every thought, every action, Life becomes the great opportunity, and death the great reward. You live in full knowledge that when you come to view your own image in the cosmic mirror after death, you can truly say, I did my best. And there goes third degree, lesson 10. I really like that, you know? How's everybody doing? Good, 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 good. All right. Well, before we will end on the April blessing and we'll do some healing in preparation for uh, the WESOC that's coming up. So just go ahead and just relax. Connect, make sure the tip of the tongue is connected. Arms and legs are uncrossed, palms facing up. To all those that we have invoked to, we humbly command, willing decree, the appropriate qualitative and quantitative tone of A U M Aum, emanating from the central spiritual sun to touch all on this call. Purifying the mental body, the astral body, the etheric body, the physical body, the inner protective web of all the energy centers of the mental body, the astral body, the etheric, and the physical. Releasing all resentment, all anger, all frustration, all greed, any low self-image, low self-esteem, poor self-image, poor self-esteem. May these be purified. We completely forgive all those that have injured us spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, sexually, financially, or in any way through thought, word, or deed, knowing or not knowing. On this day, back through all time, throughout the entire Manvantara, our cycle of time, all of our relationships back through all time, through all of our lives, all our ancestors, all their relationships back through all time, through all of our lives. We completely forgive all those that have injured us. 
We apologize to all those that we have injured, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, sexually, financially, or in any way through thought, word, or deed, knowing or not knowing. On this day, through all parallel time, back through all incarnations throughout the entire Manvantara, all of our relationships back through all time, throughout the entire Manvantara, all of our ancestors and all their relationships back through all time, throughout the entire Manvantara. We completely forgive all those that have injured us. We apologize to all those that we have injured. Cut, 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 cut. And we apologize to ourselves for the times we've injured ourselves on any level and all levels, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, sexually, financially, or any way through thought, word, or deed, knowing or not knowing. May all these events, all these souls, all these lives be free of their pain, free of their suffering, free of their sorrow, free of their past. This has been decreed, and so it is. May all these events, all these souls, all these lives be filled with the pure white light of the Christ, the pure white light of unconditional love, the pure white light of Christ consciousness, Buddhic consciousness, cosmic consciousness. May any pain, mentally, astrally, etherically, physically, whatever this means, whatever this represents, wherever this came from, you are free to go. You have served your purpose. We cut, 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 cut. We release and let this go into eternity, never to return again. May the light of the infinite being enfold you in its protective aura. May your inner self rise upon its rays to new heights of understanding and accomplishments to that high place of infinite realization where you and the Mother, Father, God are one. Let the infinite realization where you and the Father, Mother, God are one manifest spiritually, mentally, emotionally, etherically, energetically, and physically, atomically, and subatomically into every cell of the body and the space surrounding every cell, into every atom and the space surrounding every atom, unconditional love. Let the finite horizon of life which I now view become resplendent with the new vision of life eternal which lies before me. Let the song celestial become my personal hymn. ta tat so ta tat so ta tat so These blessings physicalize. How does that feel? You feel blissful? Good, good, good. Well, I will let you stay with that bliss. Enjoy these moments, and we will uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Namaste, precious, precious souls. Thank you so, so much. Take care.